Hi, this is Dr. Swanberg. Today we're talking about inference. Inference is the skill of reading between the lines or understanding things that aren't stated directly in a text. Inference is taking the details of a text and combining it with your own prior knowledge and experience and making an educated guess to answer a question that's not answered directly in the text. So I might say to you, what can you infer about the author's state of mind from reading this passage? Okay. However, an inference is not about guessing or assuming. Uh, I, I've had students say to me, well, a poem can mean anything you want it to mean. And I've said, no, actually, that's not true. A poem is bound by the words the poet chose. And those words mean particular things, and we can't venture really far away from that. Um, a valid inference will be supported by the details in the text. So there's a difference between reading something carefully and making valid inferences and just reading into it and, and putting things in the text from your own mind that aren't really in the text. And we want to go ahead and do the first one and then avoid the second. So there is a right answer. Um, when you're asked an inference question on a multiple choice test, there is only one correct answer. That's the nature of a multiple choice test. The correct answer is the one that has the most support from the text, okay? And so although you apply your own knowledge and your own experience to making an inference question and you do, you know, use your own gut and your instincts and your judgment, um, the best answer is the one that has the most support from the text. When you're asked an inference question in a short answer or essay question, there may actually be more than one correct answer, but it's up to you to explain why your inference makes sense by supporting it using details from the text. So you can't just say, well, I think he's doing this because he has a fever and he's delirious. You have to show me the evidence in the text that says that he has the fever and he is delirious, um, in addition to telling me you know, what delirium from a fever is like. We use inferences all the time in real life. It's a skill that we use socially, it's a skill we use at work, uh, it's a skill we use in reading class, but it's a skill we use really all the time. When you listen to a car noise to figure out what the problem is with the car, um, which, you know, every time I've taken my car to the mechanic, he, he takes a listen to the engine first, and very often he can diagnose it by listening, and that's making an inference, using what he knows about the engine and the typical noises that can happen when a part breaks down um, are, he's using that in addition to what he's hearing, which is the text at the time. When we gather patient symptoms to diagnose an illness that a test can't find, a blood test is awesome, but sometimes that doesn't give us the answer, and we've got to put together a set of other things um, and then infer what the illness is going to be from looking at those symptoms, uh, and that's an inference skill. When we figure out that our boss hates it when we tease her, even though she never writes anybody up for it, that's inference. You've got to look at the situation and not look at what's being said, but look at what's being implied, look at, you know, the look on her face and, and know some of her cues and make an inference and say, I don't think she likes this very much. Um, when we figure out why little Johnny has a tantrum every day right before nap, Johnny may be too young to tell us what's wrong. And we have to use inference to figure out why that keeps happening every single day and maybe be able to jump in front of it, maybe move that nap time up a little bit earlier. Um, when you figure out what it means when your wife says, I'm fine, and this is, this is just an old cliche, when a wife says, I'm fine, there's definitely a problem. Um, and it's up to you to uh, use inference to figure out what I'm fine really means, right? So we use this skill all the time in real life. We're just practicing it and reading, and we're putting a good name on it. And one of the complaints I hear all the time is, why can't writers just say what they mean instead of making us infer things all the time? Well, the plain answer is that that would just be horrible. I mean, that would just that'd be the worst writing ever. Um, there would be no art to writing if everybody just said what they meant all the time and things would be really dull. Um, so let's take a look at this little poem. It's called Devotion by Robert Frost. It says, the heart can think of no devotion greater than being sure to the ocean, holding the curve of one position, counting an endless repetition. And with inference, we get that this is about the ocean and the shore and how the shore is always next to the ocean, even though it you know, recedes at low tide. 
uh, it comes back at high tide and there are waves and coves and they go together. And that love is like that. Um, it may ebb and flow, but, it, but it's always there. It's constant. Without inference, all we get is, I want to be with you constantly. Ugh, that's just horrible. It's horrible. We need inference. Inference makes things interesting. We like things to be interesting. The second one just looks like a stalker. You don't want to do that. Um, this is love right here. This poem is love. This is just creepy. All right, so that's what inference does for us. It makes things interesting. Um, let's do a practice of making valid inferences. We're going to read this passage. Tommy and John were hot and sweaty as they sat outside the principal's office. Dirt smeared both of their faces, and they could hear their teacher's voice as she gave Mr. Jones her account of what had happened. Tommy sneered at John, and John returned the angry glare. As Miss Brown left Mr. Jones's office, the boys hung their heads so they wouldn't have to look her in the eye. And we have to ask ourselves, which of these inferences is valid? A, Tommy and John had disappointed their teacher. B, Tommy and John are sworn enemies. Or C, the principal, known for being hard on students, would yell at them both. The answer is A, Tommy and John had disappointed their teacher. Let's take a look at why we know that. Here are the clues. We know the boys were mad at each other because Tommy sneered at John and John returned the angry glare. We can guess that they'd been fighting because of the dirt smeared on their faces and they were sitting outside the principal's office. But the biggest clue is in the last sentence. The boys hung their heads so they wouldn't have to look her in the eye. And they had a disappointed teacher. So that's what makes A the strongest answer. We don't really know about them being sworn enemies. We don't have evidence of that in the text. We know they had a fight, but maybe they were friends yesterday. Um, and we don't really know anything about the principal from the passage. So really the best answer is A. Here's practice number two, making valid inferences. On January 5th, 1888, that is 11 months and four days after, my uncle Edward Prendick, a private gentleman who certainly went aboard the Lady Vane at Calo and who had been considered drowned, was picked up in latitude 5 foot 3 inches south and longitude 101 feet west in a small open boat of which the name was illegible, but which is supposed to have belonged to the missing schooner Ipachukahuna. He gave such a strange account of himself that he was supposed demented or insane. Subsequently, he alleged that his mind was a blank from the moment of his escape from the Lady Vane. His case was discussed among psychologists at the time as a curious instance of the lapse of memory consequent upon physical and mental stress. The following narrative was found among his papers by the undersigned, his nephew and heir, but unaccompanied by definite requests for publication. And here are our questions. Which of the following are valid inferences? Number one, the narrator of the story we're about to read might not be reliable or sane. <laughs> Number two, the ship sank because of a storm. Number three, the narrator went insane because of what he saw on the island. The narrator went insane because of the experience being shipwrecked. The narrator wrote the story in order to become famous. And everything the narrator says is a lie. Now, if you need to... Pause this for a second or go back and listen to it again, knowing what these questions are, or pause it and write down the questions and then go back to the paragraph and see if you can figure out which one of these is valid inference and which one is, is something we don't know yet. Okay, so give it a pause and do that exercise. All right, and we'll look at the answers together. Uh, there are two valid inferences here. One, the narrative of the story we're about to read might not be very reliable. Um, it's not a valid inference that, the, that this ship sank because of a storm or that the, why the narrator went insane, because we don't know. The narrator went insane because of his experience being shipwrecked. That we do know. Let's take a look at why. First, the paragraph tells us the narrator was judged to be insane. Experience tells us that insane people are not super reliable. Uh, you know, they tend not to be. The paragraph does not tell us how the ship sank or give us any clues about that. The ship sinks for lots of reasons and we can't assume it was a storm. So that would be reading into it, not reading inference. The paraphrase says that there is nothing remarkable on the island. We not, may not believe it, but that's just a suspicion at this point. And it's not enough to make a valid inference. The narrator was not insane before experience, 
before the experience of being shipwrecked, but he was after it. Whatever happened, it did make him crazy, or at least appear to be crazy. So that's one of the valid inferences. The paragraph tells us that his written account was found unaccompanied by any definite request for publication. That means he was not asking for it to be published at all, so he definitely wasn't doing it to get attention. Although we may not trust the narrator, we cannot assume that everything is a lie. He might be confused or he might be being wrongly judged as being insane. We don't know yet and it's too soon, too, too soon to tell. So when something's too soon to tell, you can't make a valid inference about it yet. You just have to put a pin in and see what happens. Let's have a little recap. Inference is taking the details of the text, combining it with your own prior knowledge and experience, and making an educated guess to answer a question that is not answered directly in the text. Inference is not guessing or assuming. A poem cannot mean anything you want it to mean. It is bound by the words the poet chose. Same is true of a novel. Same is true of a textbook. A valid inference will be supported by details in the text. And again, if you need to, go back through this, make some notes, do the practices again, put your active reading into play. Um, and remember that inference is definitely something where you're going to have a quiz on it. You're going to be asked to make some inferences on small passages like the ones in this lesson. So make sure you've done the practices before you take the quiz in.